Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. Uh, I am grateful that we're holding this hearing and that so many members have participated. If I have a simple point I hope to make, it's that patents really matter in this space. And if in a race to try and address other challenges facing this committee in this country, like, for example, prescription drug prices, which was our most recent hearing, we do unintended harm to our patent system, that will cause significant harm to our race, our company's race, to 5G. Um, I share my colleague's concern about the ways in which um, China is now developing what will be the most important technological advance of this coming decade. I just returned uh, from leading a congressional delegation uh, to China, South Korea, and the region. Um, 5G's potential to revolutionize uh, our lives and to produce hundreds of billions of dollars in new technologies, new applications um, are tantalizing and intriguing, but the very real potential that China will be the winner in this next generation of technology, and that will allow them to both, both exploit and benefit from and potentially disrupt what will be always on, always present, central networks that drive everything from literally our vehicles to healthcare to uh, national security to our power system um, is chilling and concerning. I'm convinced that our ability to be leaders on the global stage depends on our ability um, to command the intellectual property heights of 5G. So. Uh, let me ask you, I was encouraged to hear about the Prague principles, uh, both from the FCC commissioner in a more recent hearing and today. Um, China and South Korea are outpacing the United States in the standard essential patents, the SEPs, that will determine sort of who sets the standards and who benefits from them. We really were the dominant leader in 4G SEPs. Um, what should we be doing um, to make sure that we become the leader in 5G standard essential patents? Um, how do we challenge uh, China's announced ambitious Made in China 2025 plan to be the dominant force in this? And how central do you think intellectual property and patent licensing will ultimately be to which country or team of countries most benefits from 5G? Director Krebs, and then if you would, Assistant Secretary. So I, uh, I consciously avoided patent law in law school. Um, so I, I'm going to focus on one part of your question. I think what we have to continue to do is identify what the incentives are for American innovation. Uh, I think in terms of the radio network is, uh, devices, as is, uh, Ambassador Strayer mentioned, um, there, there's an ecosystem out there that can support, I think, at least the, our domestic capabilities. There's a level of innovation that sits above that at the right. app layer and the things that are going to be enabled. We really need to invest there. Because we're going to get to 5G, broader 5G deployments before anyone else, we have an enormous testbed opportunity in the, here in the U.S. So we're going to be able to drive global innovation drive global adoption of these things that run on 5G going forward. That's the opportunity space for us as a country. That's an optimistic read. I will tell you in my recent visit to China, um, we've got, what, 350 million people. They've got over 1.3 billion people. They are very, very rapidly racing to build out as big and robust a 5G um, set as they can. And the difference in scale in terms of our test bed requires our integration with our open society allies. And that depends on, on standards and yes. patents, and those being held by American or American-led companies. Uh, my, my policy recommendations are similar to uh, Administrator Krebs's, and that is that we need to keep pushing the right kind of incentives to get our companies involved in these, these uh, uh, standards processes so they can get standards essential patents out of them. It's hard work. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, not just doing the R&D, but then developing consensus throughout the industry that you have the solution because these, these processes almost always result in or are only finished when there's a consensus that is almost unanimity in the room about having the right uh, standards, pro the right standard to do a particular uh, function. And one of our core challenges, Senator Hawley suggested a bill I look forward to reading. Um, but that is more of a decoupling approach that says, we're going to build a world where there, you're either American technology or Chinese technology, and it assumes that it's sort of a binary world, much as we had during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, where technologically we had largely separate economies. My argument would be that that horse left the barn 20 years ago, and that frankly we have fairly thoroughly integrated innovation economies between the United States, China, and the rest of the West. How do we set standards in a way that allows free and open principles for 5G to win out? 
Well, at these standards bodies, we need to ensure that they continue relying on the substance and not political direction. As you right. may know, that the Chinese have, have uh, encouraged large numbers of people to make contributions. In some cases, we hear paying them to make contributions that kind of water down the overquality of the process. So we can only make sure that the, the, sort of the ground rules in those organizations are fair and, and cause the best ideas to percolate to the top. Now, let me just ask a closing question to try and put this in context. Um, ten years ago, these didn't exist. They weren't widely adopted. And the things that we do from hailing an Uber to checking our home security system to banking transfers that today are just routine and common uh, were big advances a decade ago. What you're trying to convey to us, what I've heard in many briefings, is that 5G is two orders of magnitude in terms of speed, content, and the applications will be dramatic and will change a lot of how we live our lives. Should the average Delawarean be concerned about the possibility that Chinese technology will be central to how that data is transferred globally between the United States and Europe or between the United States and the rest of the world? Should they be concerned about their privacy, about the stability of these networks, and about their security if China ends up holding the winning hand in the development of 5G? I think there are two ways to answer that. One is if you stay domestic, Yes, there's always going to be a global information ecosystem. The second piece, though, is when you travel, when the average Delawarean travels, they are no longer under the protection of U.S. law. Right. Uh, they are then subject to the authoritarian demands of China, their technology. Uh, that is uh, a significant concern of mine. Yeah. Our citizens shouldn't have any concern within the United States that, because our company is going to follow the best practices about management of data. They've, the telcos are building in the best security practices into the systems, and they're not uh, providing the opportunity for a vendor to undermine the entire system. Last, I, I heard what I think is a telling insight. We are having a significant disagreement with some of our core allies about backdoors. How big are they? Where are they? How are they designed? We shouldn't take our eye off the larger challenge, which is that right now, China's goal is to build the entire house. And we need to step up our game to make sure that we're part of the framing of the next generation. Thank you for your work, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.